afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here today to talk to you about SBIR. So how many, so um, we've been working with FreeMind for many years. Um, we get lots of referrals and emails back and forth with them about the very seemingly simple yet extraordinarily complex SBRS TTR programs. How many folks in the room have applied for SBRS TTRs? How many folks have won SBRS TTRs? How many folks applied last week for the January 5th deadline? So I'm glad this meeting wasn't last week, right? So, all right, so um, I have a lot of information here. Most folks will probably understand the basics of the program. We can kind of zip through that. We could do lots of questions. We, we have an hour, um, but there are some important changes and updates to the program that I do want to make sure you guys understand, especially after last week's deadline, next deadline, and from here on out, we'll have some changes related to clinical trials. How many folks are going to be doing clinical trial work now or in the future with any of their technology? So we're going to talk about some new requirements that you're going to have to follow whether uh, to apply to NIH in general to get funding for your clinical trial work. So we're going to cover the, the basics, the backgrounds. We're going to talk about congressional action reauthorization, some really, really nice provisions we have which are gone that we need to have back, and we need uh, acts of Congress, which are hard to come by nowadays. We'll talk a little bit about um, our peer review and transitioning. We'll talk about our solicitations and where you can go to find all the stuff. So sbir.nih.gov, this is our website. Everything is up here. Um, the left blue menu gets you everywhere. Um, if you're new, click on the yellow button on the left. New to SBIR, it gets you to the interactive infographic that kind of goes to the very base of the program. You mouse over all this stuff, you get more information with additional links. So SBIRS TTR, Congressionally Mandated Programs, which is a set-aside program of the extramural budget. It's not a set-aside of the entire budget of an agency, just the part of the agency that's extramural where the money goes out. At NIH, that's about 80% of our overall budget. So 3.2% of our extramural goes to SBIR, Small Business Innovation Research, 0.45% for STTR. They're very related programs. In our agency, they are kind of treated more or less as one and the same. Slight, different pots of money, but the rules, except for two, which we'll talk about, are identical for the programs. And just because STTR is smaller in percentage and in overall budget, the success rates you'll see are about the same. So SBIR started 35 years ago. Act of Congress in 1982. Those are the four congressional uh, lead listed goals of the program. And I'm not going to read all my slides, but you can take a look at them. But it's all about using the private sector to commercialize technology, which at the time was a very weird thing for the government to get into. Why should the government give research grants and contracts to for-profit small businesses where in the end the government doesn't get any particular thing in return um, we don't get royalties. It's non-dilutive. That's why we're here. Um, we don't get ownership. We don't get, you know, a kickback or anything like that. We do get the tax revenue, um, which apparently will now be a little bit less. But um, that's okay. So we'll manage. So, um, but we do want the good. The good thing we want in the end is the good story. And for NIH, we want to improve public health and really um, change people's lives. As TTR was started 10 years later in 1992. Uh, Act of Congress, primary difference is that you have to, the small business partners with a not-for-profit, typically a university. Eleven agencies in the federal government have SBR and STTR, $2.5 billion every year. That's grown up quite a bit in the past several years. NIH is a part of the Department of Health and Human Services, um, HHS, and we are the second largest. The numbers on the right are from two years ago, 2015, and our number says $800 million. I know it's really small, um, but you can certainly have these slides. So it says uh, $800 million. Keep that number in mind for when I show you the 2017 number. Um, you know, Department of Defense, NIH, Department of Energy, NASA, National Science Foundation, top five agencies. Um, if you look at the, the pie chart on the right, you can see those top five agencies make up around 95% of the overall program by dollars. The remaining six agencies, USDA, Homeland Security, Commerce, Transportation, Education, and EPA, would make up the remaining 5%. Um, and the, it's color-coded for granting agencies versus contracting agencies. How many folks have applied for uh, contracts for SBIR with the uh, Department of Defense or NASA or something like that? 
And how many folks uh, apply for grants to a granting agency? So um, in the end, you know, the money to you is green. Um, a contract and a grant is just a vehicle the government pushes out money for. Their rules are different, application process is different, but the money in the end is the same, um, in the same color. And so this is the last year we're able to, you know, we'll update this when we get some decent information about the overall size of the program. But now 2017, which is the fiscal year we just finished, um, NIH, um, as a part of HHS, we're not all of it, but we had 861 million in SBIR, 121 million in STTR. Those are 3.2% and 0.45%. Within the Department of Health and Human Services, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the Administration on Community Living and the Food and Drug Administration do have SBIR programs at the amounts shown there, 11 million, 3 million, and 1 million. Those are annual numbers. So yes, FDA has a $1 million annual SBIR program to make a couple of awards. They don't do STTR. But combined, all total, this is about $1 billion. So in two short years, we went from $800 million to around $1 billion of SBIR STTR, not a small amount of money, all of which has to go to for-profit small businesses in life science to commercialize technology. Phased research program, most of you know this, completely unrelated to the clinical trial phases. Yes, we fund clinical trials in SBIR. Yes, we have phase one and 2A and 2B clinical trials. We have phase one and two and three SBIR. And same word, different meaning. So phase one, short, small feasibility study, a couple hundred K, uh, six months, one year. All the numbers on this slide are guidelines and not hard caps. We get a lot of questions on this. People trying to jam their work to $150,000 and zero, zero cents to the penny. Guidelines, you ask, we always tell you to ask for the amount of money you need to do the work. If, we, if it does well in peer review, if we have the money and it's within our mission priorities, we'll pay it. We're not gonna shortchange your grant unless we have you know, particular reasons for overlap or things like that. We do not, we're not in the business of underfunding technology so that it, just so it can fail. Within reason, we're not gonna give you a $2 million phase one. We're going to, not going to give you an eight million dollar phase two, but we have we do have we have made five and six hundred thousand dollar phase ones on occasion. We have made three and four million dollar phase twos. We want to make sure we fund as best we can within our abilities to do so. With a billion dollars, you do have a lot of flexibility to do that. Um, phase two, full R and D, one million dollars, two million dollars, three million dollars, up to two years, three years. You have to have a phase one to get a phase two. People don't like that. We had this great provision called direct phase two. How many people heard of direct phase two? Yeah, that was fun, but it went away because Congress, the law expired. We're trying to get that back. That was a very popular provision for a number of reasons, let alone that you can go right for the big money and skip the little money. NIH has a second full phase two. How many folks knew about that the phase two B program? You can get a first phase two for one or two million dollars. You can get a whole nother second phase two for three million dollars over three years. Um, a lot of folks will use this, obviously, for clinical trials and other kinds of things. Um, many, but not all, of our institutes use it because of the size of the awards, and we'll see how it breaks out with NIH. How many folks are, use the NSF SBR program? NSF has something called Phase 2B. It is different. We, we use the language differently. The NSF Phase 2B is a supplement to their existing Phase 2 and requires, it's a match to them bringing in outside money. Ours is a second full phase two where you apply, goes to peer review, et cetera. Phase three, the tricky, sticky wicket. No SBIR funding for commercialization work. NIH is also not gonna be the customer. We are not gonna buy your technology um, or connect you with a large prime, but we do want your technology commercialized on the open marketplace. So you need to be considering when you come in where your next follow-on set of funding is gonna be. <coughs> be it angels, venture uh, strategics, or any of the other 10 uh, sources that uh, we heard the previous speaker talk about. Eligibility, the truly most complicating and infuriating aspect of the entire program is the complicated organizational structure of the company that is set in law. It's, most companies, thankfully, fall into a relatively simple ownership structure. So first, for profit. Um, you would be surprised and probably not surprised about the kinds of questions I get um, about uh, 
can I apply, who's the applicant, is this good or not, and, and it's pretty easy to answer most of the questions. Nonprofits are not, can apply, universities can apply. Um, 500 or fewer, SBA sets those designations. That is, most of our companies are really, truly small. Uh, five or 10 employees, 10 or 20. We have very many that are true startups, one, two, or three employees. Yes? I'm gonna tell you that right now. It's not even an NIH definition, it's a federal wide definition. US uh, owned and operated, work, and that's what we say. That means, that comes into the bottom. So the company must legally be formed in the U.S., must have U.S. majority ownership, which I'll describe in a minute, and must do all the work in the U.S. This is a program started by Congress, which in the end means it's a jobs program to drive the economy. And the jobs need to be here because that's the way it has to be. So um, we, it also does all the research and things of that nature as well. So ownership. The first bullet there is by far the vast majority of our companies. Companies must be majority owned by U.S. citizens or permanent residents, individuals who are U.S. citizens or permanent residents, not 50%, not two co-owners, one U.S., one foreign, each owns exactly 50% of the shares. That's not eligible, majority owned. Most of our companies are a handful of founders, and you're fine. Second bullet. An SBIR and STTR firm can be majority owned by another company or a set of companies that are themselves majority owned by individuals or U.S. citizens. We have a lot, I just got some questions earlier today in my email box about a company who has a lot of ownership by individuals who are using their personal corporations to invest in a company. And so their um, LLCs are their sole proprietorships. Those are not individuals. Those are legal organizations. And so even if it's a one person organization, that is an organization, not an individual. Lastly, and this is only for SBIR, this is what we call the VC rule. An SBIR firm can be majority owned by multiple venture capital companies, hedge funds, or private equity firms, no one of which can own more than half. So two or more VC firms, if the VC firms are US owned, can own an SBIR. You can have 30%, 30% by two VCs, and that can be eligible for SBIR. This is an exceedingly tiny number of our um, companies. Single digit numbers of companies per year apply and are awarded that are VC firms. The vast majority are your standard, traditional, couple of uh, one or two or three or whatever founders that are US owned and operated. Um, and foreign owners, and we don't care what happens in the minority. So we care about majority ownership. If there's foreign ownership, if VCs own a minority, that's okay. We don't look at minority, we look at the majority. Um, and folks still, um, I just talked to folks today at another event, they were telling me about their absolutely fantastic technology and they had an interesting uh, accent um, um, they were talking about and, and so these two British gentlemen from the UK have a UK company. UK companies aren't eligible. Um, they can apply to the SBRI program, that's the UK version of SBIR, but not SBIR. And most companies in the world actually talk to our office and start up SBIR-like programs in all of their companies around the world. It's quite, uh, the program is quite replicated. All of these have to be met at time of award, not time of application. So we do have companies that are in flux or come in with uh, ownership structure that may or may not work and they could reorganize if they needed to during the process. STTR, applicants, the same small business concern, follows everything here except the last bullet, which is not applied to STTR. Um, we do get university partners working with the small business saying, can we submit? No, business submits. The 40-30 split, minimum of 40% of the budget must go to the small business under an STTR, minimum of 30 to the, the university or research institution partner. The other 30% is up in the air, can go to one, the other, both, third or fourth parties. And so that becomes an interesting scenario which doesn't seem right, but is. And that you could have the university partner get 60, 60% of the budget. They can do that. They can get their 30% and they can do the remaining 30%. They have the majority of the budget. They are still a sub-awardee or a subcontractor to the prime US small business. 
um, and the two parties put together an IP agreement, mainly for their protection, that we have some models for. And of course, any um, we really advise folks to talk to their patent attorneys when they're doing these collaborations. They're almost identical in every way with, except with regards to the two, the principal investigator or PI and the work split. The PI, uh, let's do partnering first. SBIR allows partnering, it's optional. And SBIRs can outsource a third of the budget in phase one and half in phase two. STTR, the 40-30 split I talked about. Why are they not the same? Congress just wrote the law that way. They could be the same, um, but that would require a change of law. But they're different but at this amount. The principal, but SBR is optional. If the small business has the capabilities, the equipment, the staff, the facilities, and the personnel, they can take the whole grant and do all the work. Principal investigator PI. This is another tricky uh, business here. We have lots of entrepreneurial professors who spin off companies, um, but they cannot have their cake and eat it too. They cannot spin off their company, be the PI on an SBIR, and retain their university full-time appointment and all the benefits that go with it. PI on SBIR must have primary employment at the small business. Appointment. Um, how much they request off the grant doesn't matter. They might request 10 or 20 or 30% effort, but the appointment has to be greater than 50%. Half-time appointment is not count, is no good. And so that typically means they have to go to part-time at a university. A lot of times we have professors uh, put in their trainees, their postdoc or their graduate student, after they're done in as employee number one, as the uh, PI, and they are the founder and mentor and on the board, and they provide a lot of support that way. But that's okay, that, that's fine. STTR PI can be from the university partner or the small business. Um, they have to be primary wherever they're gonna be the PI. So you can have an STTR where the PI is at the university and runs the whole project in collaboration with the company staff and the university gets 60% of the money. That is still a award to a small business and the university is a subcontractor. So always a award to the small business. Um, de eligibility determined at time of award. PI doesn't have to have an uh, advanced degree or any degree of that matter. We look at the entire team, the PI, the expertise, the consultants, um, the board, all that kind of things are looked at in peer review to see can the team do the work. Companies can submit applications to different agencies. You can send the same application to NIH and to NSF and to DOD. You can't accept it twice though. We're going to not let you do that and if we make an accident or you try to game us, the Inspector General is not going to have a good time with you. So um, you can, though, submit similar work to other agencies if it fits their mission. Within NIH, you cannot submit to the same application to do different institutes. We have uh, secondary assignments for that kind of thing. So within our agency, you send one application per project and we can have several ways to track it with the assignments. Um, so that's the overview. Most of the things I talked about are the same no matter what agency you're applying to of the 11. There are little nuances here and there, but those are the generalized rules of the programs. Specifics to NIH, this is the mission statement of NIH. I'm not gonna read it, but draw your attention to the blue part, which says application of that knowledge to enhance health, length, and life, and reduce illness and disability. SBIR is the ultimate in applied research programs. It is a product-driven program. We have some folks who talk to us about doing all this fantastic research to um, advance the knowledge in a field. That's fantastic. We have 97% of our money for that. F apply for an R01 or an R21. SBAR is about making widgets and getting them on the market into patients and the, and the population. NIH looks like this, an incredible 27 institute bureaucracy and then some. Um, my office coordinates out of the office of the director and 24 of the 27 institutes do SBAR and STTR, and they're in light blue. It is not hard to figure out what they're interested in. Their titles, by and large, say it all. Cancer Institute, Eye Institute, Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, and so on and so forth. Um, and so when you come to us with an idea, we're gonna refer you to one or more of these, and there is some overlap. So um, it seems complicated, but in fact, we're all very friendly, and we will answer the phone and talk to you. So how does NIH divvy up its money? This is last year. Fiscal 17, just NIH was 982 mil. Um, fiscal 18 is, we don't know. The government runs out of money next week. 
you know, on uh, January 19th. Supposedly, we will get a couple weeks of another continuing resolution, and then maybe we'll get a flat budget or an uh, increase. And so if you read what you believe, you know, the House and the Senate want to give NIH a small increase um, of one or two billion dollars. That will trickle down into SBIR proportionally if that happens. 24 institutes, they're all in the pie chart in size order. National, um, and there's an interesting thing. There is no such thing as the National Institute of Health. It's National Institutes of Health. There is no such thing as the NIH budget. There are 27 line item appropriation budgets from Congress that collectively make up our budget. Each of the 24 institutes get a line item appropriations, and a percentage of that goes to SBIR, STTR. Uh, NCI, uh, National Cancer Institute, Allergy and Infectious Disease, Heart, Lung, and Blood, General Medical Sciences, <coughs> Aging, uh, and so on and so forth, all the way around. Um, National Library of Medicine is, I guess, the orange sliver at 12 o'clock noon. Um, what's the order of magnitude? NCI is about a $150 million SBR program, around 15 percent of the overall budget. That's because their overall budget of $5 billion is around 15 percent. Library of Medicine has about a $1 million, $1.2 million SBRS teacher program. There's a two order of magnitude difference between the largest and the smallest institute, and of course, everything in between. A couple of million, three, four, five, 20, 30, 40, 50 million. Just because an institute is medium or small at 9 to 12 o'clock on that chart does not necessarily mean it's harder to get an award there. I'm going to show you the success rates on the next slide, but they're an average. Um, National Cancer Institute, with all the money, not surprisingly, gets the largest volume of applications. Their success rates are typically lower than the other institutes on average because they get such a large volume of applications. And so it's important to keep that in mind. So some of our institutes have um, pr pretty decent success rates, and your definition of pretty decent varies, um, clearly. So success rates. The, uh, this is last fiscal 16. I don't have the 17 numbers yet. They're going to be waiting for me when I get back. <coughs> Blue bars are SBIR. Red bars are STTR. Se let's look at the second set of bars, phase one. 13 or 14 percent for a phase one success rate, 15 percent in some years, 16 percent in some years. doesn't matter whether you're applying to NIH, NSF, DOD. It's roughly a 15 percent success rate, give or take a couple of points from year to year, from program to program, not by design. That's just how the program tends to work out. Third set of bars, phase, regular phase two, way up there at 30%, sometimes 40%, sometimes 50. It varies from year to year, but it, more or less it's in that range. Um, lots of folks really scratched their head. Why the heck is phase two so high? Um, because the phase two applicant pool is phase one awardees. That's who can apply for phase two. Phase one applicant pool is, quote, open to the world, any eligible small business. And I have, you'll see the next slide, the volume, how many thousands of applications we get, and we get thousands. The second phase 2B, um, SBIR 30%, around the same as a phase 2. We did make one STTR second phase 2 award. Um, at the bottom right, we got one application. That's a, that's a success rate of 100%. If I put the bar on the chart, everything will get crushed. So for transparency, it's there. Um, those who like the direct phase two program, skip the, uh, you, you do feasibility on your own, apply for direct phase two, and fiscal 15 is around a 17% success rate. That's around a phase one success rate. That's what actually we expected. It's a brand new to NIH application. It's open to anybody who can put in for it. We had something which we also uh, like, the commercialization readiness pilot program. Who heard of the CRP? We had it for two years and then the authority expired. So that was a follow-on award to a phase two or two B for another $3 million, an additional set of money you can put together. So you can see with SBI, you can string together on a single project five, six, seven million dollars across a couple of years. That had a 22% success rate. Then way back on the far left, fast track, combination phase one and two in one application, that's about a phase one success rate of around 15%. Volume. Um, you don't have to look at all this chart, but you can see that we get Overall, at the bottom, thousands of applications, 7,500 overall applications, uh, fiscal 16, SBRS, TTR, all phases combined. Phase one at the top, SBIR, 4,000 applications, 500 awards. There's a, a success rate, 12 percent um, at the time. 
Phase two is 1,100. So you can see it's a high volume agency. The numbers on the right only add up to $467 million. Where's the other $500 million? That's because NIH is an annual appropriation agency. We get our money every year. We have to spend it every year to zero. And so we only fund awards one year at a time. And so $500 million is tied up in last year's second year of the phase two, third year of the phase two, of what we call our commitment base. Um, and so, but this is the volume, and these are the numbers that you're competing, you're dealing with. Um, for, an, another good thing is, SBRS Heater has the highest volume of first time to NIH applications. And so what this chart shows is over the past 10, 11 years, roughly one third of our applications come from new to NIH companies, never applied before to NIH. Um, and so, and then about a third of our awards are to first-time applicant companies. And so this is to show that we get a lot of new blood in the program every single year. Lots of new companies or new to apply to NIH companies come in and get awards each and every year. You know, with the most of our other programs, which are university focused, new universities don't crop up every year. And so the number of universities is kind of stable in the country, but small businesses come and go, as we know. And so we do have a lot of, of new blood in the program every single year. So those are the specifics. Reauthorization. We live and die by acts of Congress in SBIR because the program was started by Congress. Congress put expiration dates on the program, and therefore Congress must pass a law to continue the program, presumably and preferably before the expiration date, not after. So the program was set to expire in 2017. Congress before the 2016 election and before the change of Congress administration got ahead of itself for uh, a surprise and passed a five-year extension of the programs through uh, 2022. And they basically did a date change. They changed 2017 and made it 2022. 20, uh, it was a simple one-line reauthorization they tacked on to the defense bill, which is a must-pass bill. And so the, all the programs overall writ large are good to go for five years, except there were several items in there that had their own special individualized expiration dates on new authorities, which they didn't change, and they're gone. So the SBIR Direct Phase Two was a pilot with a separate expiration date of September 30th, 2017. The commercialization within this pilot program, we call that the SB1 mechanism, 2017. The 3% agency SBR admin funds, which allows us to do outreach and support companies. In fact, we pay for companies to attend all kinds of events and pitch and all kinds of other things we do with that money. That expired. And our phase zero proof of concept centers where we provide in university incubators in six regions around the country. All of that expired last September. We have no authority to do that. And those are really important parts of the program, which are very, A, popular among applicants and have become quite needed by us to do the, uh, the best job we can. There are bills passed and circulating in Congress to extend all of these four things from anywhere from one to five years and do other things as well. Um, and so there are bills, and you, this is all public information. You can look those bill numbers up and read what's in them. And so we are anxiously awaiting some congressional action to get back these authorities. The program is fine. Phase one, phase two, fast track, a billion dollars a year. None of that's going away. That's good through 2022. But these specialized programs are, are essentially gone, and we designed them that way when we had knew it was expiring. So all the funding opportunities expired. We can't make new awards in these particular programs until we get that authority back. Questions about reauthorization. It's a tricky business. We follow the Hill very closely. We occasionally testify and provide information about the benefits of these, uh, mainly for the community, that, we, that the small business community you know, was really interested in the direct phase two and the CRP programs, and they benefit from them, and that's what Congress likes to hear. So hopefully we'll get those authorities back. So you heard about the program. You heard about the money. You heard about the, the, what we can't do. So where do you get the money? The funding website, sbr.nh.gov slash funding. We cross post all of our funding opportunities on the SBA's main SBR site, sbir.gov. And so you can always go to uh, two places, but always come to the source to get the most up-to-date information. So we, NIH, the CDC, and the FDA put out a parent 
omnibus solicitation, uh, one for SBIR, one for STTR, PA 17302 and 303, these expired last week. Everybody always thinks the world is coming to an end and we've canceled the programs. Um, we will, next week, issue brand new omnibus solicitations um, for the next set of due dates. The world will not end, we will be there. Um, and so um, we're going to issue them next week. We're going to talk about some changes with them coming up in a minute, but they're going to come out again. We also do contracts. We're the only agency that does grants and contracts. Roughly 90% of our budget goes to grants, 10% for contracts. We issue pretty narrowly defined topics uh, for contracts with deliverables like all contracts kind of do. And we have a once a year call for that with a once a year due date. We get four or five institutes, about 40 or 50 topics. Um, for that, that closes in October, that opens in the summer and closes in the fall. The omnibus can be anything within the mission of NIH. We have a 200 page topics document that you're welcome to read and search through to see if what you're doing is in there, but even if it's not there and you're doing life science, we're gonna accept your application and you're not disadvantaged for not applying to a topic. NIH guide for grants and contracts. How many folks get the weekly Friday email from NIH about the new funding opportunities. One, two, three, good. There's a lot of information in there, and I encourage everybody to go here and sign up. NIH issues new funding opportunities every single workday. On any given day, there either is or is not SBR and STTR funding opportunities, but you can find out about it when we do it, um, and you can actually sign up for an RSS feed and get you know, alerts and all that kind of thing. Um, but also, you may or may not know this, small businesses can apply for almost every funding opportunity at NIH, including our R01s and R21s. They're perfectly fine and eligible. And so you may or may not find a specific funding opportunity that exactly calls for what you're doing. And even if it's not an SBIR, as long as small businesses are eligible, you should talk to a program officer and consider applying. We put out many, many targeted funding opportunities called PAs, PARs, RFAs, things like that, requests for applications <coughs> in SBIR. These are high priority areas for our institutes and centers, ICs. Sometimes a single institute issues one, sometimes there's two or three or four or five. They may have special due dates, they may have a regular due dates, they may have one date. It might be a single call for a single due date. Those are typically high priority areas with real money set aside behind them, set asides of the set aside. So SBIR may be a, bil a billion dollars, but a, an institute may issue a high profile RFA, let's just say in opioids, and say we're gonna commit $10 million just to this RFA this year. And so you're not competing against every other small business for the entire pool, you're competing against the people who apply to that funding opportunity for that $10 million. There may be additional review criteria, there might be different instructions. So our omnibus follow the standard due dates, and I'll show you them in a minute. Um, all the panels are at the Center for Scientific Review and Special Small Business Panels, and they follow our regular application instructions. These RFAs may have special due dates, or may they, they may use the regular dates. The panels might meet at CSR, the panels might meet at the Institute, and there may be additional specialized instructions. You definitely want to read the funding opportunity announcement, FOA, very carefully. I know they're terrible documents. I mean, the FOAs aren't that bad, to be honest. The FOAs are, if you print them, which they're hard to print, they're like 10, 12 pages, the FOAs. The application instructions are 200 pages, but we actually worked, and they're online now, so, um, but we try to work to make them as useful and reader-friendly as possible. But we know there's a lot of material out there. So um, this just is a graphical chart of everything we've got. We've talked about phase one, phase two, second phase two, phase three. I put on here, you know, these expired authorities because when they come back, all I have to do is delete the red. I don't have to make a new chart. So um, I didn't even take them off our website. I just put a line on the website saying this is gone. So when they come back, I, uh, I don't have to worry about it. But this is to set the stage for, uh, to talk about, we talk about fast track a little bit, combination phase one and two application in a phase two uh, page limit. It's reviewed all at once in study section. If it does well, we make the phase one award company does the phase one. Instead of applying for phase two and waiting nine months or 18 months, depending on how many tries it takes, you send your final report to your program officer, and within a few weeks to a month, they can issue the phase two. It's designed to 
really close the funding gap. You need to be a bit more of a mature company with good preliminary data to be competitive and fast track, around a 15% success rate. Phase 2B, I talked about this. Second phase 2, uh, up to $3 million, about 18 or 20 of our 24 institutes participate because of budgetary limitations in their institute. The institutes at the top of the chart that have one or two million dollars a year can't do this, they'd run out of money. But you always want to talk to your PO. If you got a phase two, talk to them about the second phase two. Applying, grants, electronic. How many folks on January 5th used the Adobe Forms D? You're done. Yeah, no, no, not assist. How many use the old Adobe forms where you push the button and get them into grants? Like, how many use assist? How many folks have used workspace? So assist and workspace are it from now on. The actual Adobe forms that you download and fill in, and do, those are gone. Grants.gov doesn't support them anymore, and it's all electronic now, and I recommend that you guys use assist. It's an NIH-built system that helped us because very useful. But you've got to do all this work to register and all these things. Most of those you're already in and you know about. Take six to eight weeks. If you've never applied before and you're thinking about putting in for April, start now getting these registrations in process. SAM is the worst and the trickiest. It can take the longest amount of time. The Federal Service Desk, which does SAM, can be useful. Um, if you have trouble with any registrations, I recommend just calling the NIH ERA Service Desk. They can help you with all of them. SAM has to be renewed annually. How many folks knew that? How many folks forget that? Because when, you, when, you're, when your SAM registration expires on April 3rd and the due date's April 5th, you are out of luck. It takes almost as long to renew your SAM as it does to get it started in the first place, which is a week, a business week or two. And unfortunately, or fortunately, we don't have leniency for late applications for not keeping on top of these things. Um, so. Electronic. Our contracts at the bottom also went electronic a couple years ago as well, which is much easier using a different system. So that's been very helpful. We no longer accept paper proposals of any kind. Um, so submit via assist. Our, app, our funding opportunities have two buttons, a bright green one that says apply using assist and a non-green one that says apply using grants like of workspace. It's bright green and out there for a reason. You can use whatever you want. Um, but we built a system, we can help you with it a little bit better, and it has a lot of nice features with it, like copying applications over from one forward to another, um, passing control around to different people, and it also validates and clears all your errors before you submit so that you get error free, which is nice, and oh, you can preview your application PDF, which you can't do prior, so you can actually see what your P uh, application will look like. So definitely, I recommend using Assist. Clinical trials, raise the hands again. Doing clinical trials. So NIH, this last year and this year, are initiating a whole new set of initiatives to improve our stewardship of clinical trials. Some of this is news to people. Some of this is a few years old. And so some of the big, big changes happening from here on out, April 5th and beyond. We have a new human subjects form that collects information. We have a new clinical trial form that collects all kinds of information. In reality, it's the same information you used to have to put all over the Adobe forms, here, there, and everywhere. Now it's just all in one place in a structured form. Um, it'll feel like it's more work, but it's work you kind of had to do anyway in most cases. Um, we now have policy that you used to have, you have to use a single institutional review board for domestic multi-site studies. This, doesn't happen as much in SBR as in academia, but it does happen. Everybody who is working on clinical trials, be it out there in the community or even NIH staff, have to get annual uh, training and go clinical practice. We have new clinical trial specific funding opportunity announcements, new review criteria to go with it, and expanded registration and reporting of clinical trial results in clinicaltrials.gov. Everyone knows that getting a federal grant is, is not the gimme that we don't actually ever sell it like that. Um, but you, there's a lot of reporting and compliance requirements, one of which is reporting results in clinicaltrials.gov. But clinical trial-specific funding opportunity announcements are huge, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. 
So we did update the definition of a clinical trial in 2014. It is not new. But basically, um, there are four questions that we pose in a, in, a, in a decision tree. And if you basically answer yes to all four, you've got an NIH clinic defined clinical trial. Whether you believe it or not, you do. And you're going to have to follow the, the clinical trial rules. Um, so more studies than not than before are now classified in, as clinical trials. This is the definition, and I will just uh, leave it here for you to read for a minute. There's a decision tree that kind of gives you four yes-no questions, but um, it includes biobehavioral outcomes as well. And so it, it has to do about interventions and assigning human subjects. And so you can look at this, and you, you're going to think, well, that's close, but it's not me, and it may well be you. And so um, we're going to have some leniency as we figure this out with you, but this covers more people than people. Re this covers more than people realize. So what does this operationally mean for SBIR with these new funding opportunities? We used to, we've always had two omnibus parents for a long, long time. One for SBIR, one for STTR. With a 200-page topics list, we've had tons of RFAs and stuff like that. But think about the parents. We have two. Now we're going to have four. One SBIR, clinical trial not allowed. That's going to be the standard omnibus parent. All 24 institutes are going to sign up for that. And that's where you come if you're doing anything other than a clinical trial in SBIR. Clin SBIR, clinical trial not allowed. And in fact, if you open up that forward, there will not be a clinical trial form on it. And if you check yes to clinical trial, you're going to get an error because it's, you're using the wrong funding opportunity. STTR omnibus clinical trial not allowed. Uh, 20, all 24 institutes, same thing. That's kind of what we used to have. SBIR clinical trial required. SBIR and ST, clinical trial required. STTR clinical trial required. This will have around 17 of the 24 institutes signed onto it, 16 or 17. So under this omnibus, at least one of your aims must propose an NIH-defined clinical trial. Um, the FOA will look pretty much the same with a couple extra things. The forms will look pretty much the same, except they'll have a clinical trial form. So if you're under doing that, then you're going to fill out the human subjects section uh, and the clinical trial section. There will be additional questions in the review criteria related to clinical trials that peer review will look at. And so the question is, well, what do I do if I'm, below, I'm applying to one of the six or seven institutes that are not on those clinical trial required FOAs? They may have, they may be issuing their own clinical trial SBR and STTR FOAs. They may also do other things. And so what we've done in the new topics document, we've reorganized it a little bit. We've asked every institute in their section to say, A, will you accept clinical trials under SBIR, yes or no? And then, if yes, will you accept clinical trials under the omnibus? If they check yes, then you go to the C, the clinical trial required FOA. Will you accept clinical trials under a institute-issued SBIR clinical trial funding opportunity? They may say yes. Then there might be a PA or a PAR or an RFA. They may do both. They may say, we'll accept them under the omnibus clinical trial FOA. We'll accept them under an RFA we're going to write. Will you accept clinical trials under a non-SBIR funding opportunity announcement for small businesses? Some of them, most of them will say no. A couple will say yes. Certain institutes will not accept SBIR uh, clinical trials under SBIR no matter what. They want it to come in under an R01 or a U01 or an R whatever, so they can have all of their institutes' clinical trials looked at and evaluated um, so they can make institute-wide decisions under clinical trials. So in those cases, you are a small business, you're eligible, you're in the pool with other folks applying for clinical trials. But it is an institute decision, and we try to make it clear what you should do. And, and in the end, you should always, always, always call us or call them and ask, I'm going to do a clinical trial, what's the right funding opportunity for me? And they will tell you. So that's what I'm going to say about clinical trials. Um, it's, a, it's new. It's confusing. It's a, it's, we're doing training internally and externally. We're going to do two webinars in February that you'll hear about. Um, one's going to be for a regular SBIR omnibus webinar if you're not doing clinical trials, and one's going to be if you are. 
the content's going to be similar. It's going to be, most of this talk is going to be in there, but then we're going to talk about some specific clinical trial things about the new form, things I don't have time to go into today. Women-owned small, so I'm going to move on to finish up here. Women-owned small business and socially and economically disadvantaged small business, or SDB, or minority-owned small business. We have a, if you look, if you remember way back to the goals of the program from Congress, the third bullet said to foster the participation of underrepresented groups in SBR and STTR. We are looking for more participation by women and minority owned small businesses. We do collect information on the front page on whether your, your business is women owned, majority women owned, and majority uh, socially economically disadvantaged business. We do this solely and expressly for tracking purposes only at a volume. We want to know how many applications come in the door. We want to know how many awards go out the door. We do not use this information in any way for funding decisions. You are neither advantaged nor disadvantaged um, in funding time or in peer review. It's solely for the tracking purposes so we know what we are, how we're doing and how we need to work on it. Um, uh, you know, and SBIR, no matter what agency, is always based on scientific merit, budget, and uh, priority. If you're applying for government service contracts, and how many folks here are in the business of applying for government service contracts? That guy. So if you're a women-owned small business, a minority of small business, an 8A, a hub zone, a service disabled vet, those can give you competitive advantages in applying for government service contracts. Um, but not in SBIR. We collect the information to, for tracking purposes only. We push this really hard because A, it's important to us to try to increase participation, and B, companies don't know whether to check the box or not, and in fact, check it differently every time. We have companies who are a women-owned small business, this application and not on that application, and we don't know what the truth is. We really, we have a data quality issue, um, so it's self-reporting, but we do wanna at least know what we're doing and how we're doing. So peer review, um, that's a whole nother talk for a whole nother day, but SBIRs go into special small business panels made up of a mix of academic and uh, industry reviewers. It's a long and winding road from submission to award. Um, and we use external peer review. Due dates, standard due dates, September, January, April 5th. So the January 5th due date go, that we just had last week goes to peer review February, March. Secondary Advisory Council, May and June, funding in July or August, um, end of fiscal year. So these are timelines, and some of these are delayed or are delayed because we don't have a budget. So you know, those, that's one of the few things outside of our control is when we get our money. So I've mentioned this a couple of times, but the most, two most important pieces of advice, call us. There is no uh, blackout period. You, there's always a time where you can call us and speak to a program officer about your application, about what funding opportunity is right. Do I do phase one? Do I do fast track? Do I do, I do SBAR, STTR? What about clinical trials? Um, anything. We also help companies. We send companies to investor events all the time, so um, all kinds of things like that. Submit early. Early means days. Days. Not minutes, not, not hours, and certainly not minutes. And so, I know. We get 2,000 applications around, give or take, and a thousand of them come the last four hours. <laughs> and hundreds of them come the last five minutes. Who knows what, who knows what on time means? I mean, does somebody want to, really, what's, what our definition of on time is? I heard midnight, that's not right. 5 p.m. local time of your business, not where you are. 5 p.m. local time of where your business is, addresses. And so, error-free on time. So don't submit and hit the road for a work trip or vacation. Live in the ERA Commons, check the status. When everybody applies at the last minute, the system takes more than one minute to process your application. So you apply a couple of days in advance, five or six or 10 minutes later, you're getting an auto email from ERA saying you're good to go. When you apply the last hour, the last five minutes, they may take an hour or two to get your email because the person is slogging through a thousand applications. You get the auto email at 6 p.m. telling you you have errors. Go in and fix them, you'll be fine. But um, you get, you have a few, there's a little bit of leeway, but you gotta do it before the date change. So um, the next day. But really, you come in on the 6th, you're dead in the water without a legitimate late excuse. 
weather disaster, hurricane, immediate illness, uh, illness or medical issue of the PI only or their immediate family, not anybody else on the team, just the PI. And waiting for the support letter, and I got this last week, waiting for your support letter from your collaborator is not acceptable. You, you go with what you've got um, by 5 p.m. Um, or you know, if they get it to you the day after or if it's wrong or whatever, and you cannot submit your, your letters late. So we got that question. Well, I don't have it. Can I submit the uh, letter of support after the fact to the SRO? No. We have a late submission policy that's very narrowly defined about what you can submit late. Um, and it's, it's, it's quite narrow. And, and late letters of support late are, are not going to go in. So if you have questions, you email us at sbir at od.nih.gov. That will help you out there, find things out. We have a listing of all of our program officers, and so um, on, on the page above. Um, lastly, we offer a, several programs. After you get your award, we continue to help you out with programs we pay for that we offer to you free of charge outside of your time, which we know isn't free. Um, uh, so we have a phase one program called Niche Assessment Program and a phase two program called Commercialization Accelerator. Niche helps our phase one active awardees with a customized market report and Foresight Science and Technology does that for us. We have 175 and 200 slots per year. We open this program up in October every year right after the end of the fiscal year so all the people who got very last minute awards can partake. And so they do this work for you. Uh, you do a simple intake form, have a talk to them for an hour or two, and then you get a really nice market report, which the main thing it can be used for is helping you write a really strong phase two commercialization plan. Commercialization Accelerator CAP program by Larda Inc. is our phase two program for a customized eight to nine month hands-on mentoring with a principal advisor and expert resources to help in any and all of these things on the slide. It's very, we take 80, 90 companies a year in that. Um, and we pay for that. You have a little bit of travel that you pay for, but um, you can actually use your grant for that with your travel money if you have an active grant. And so this program really um, works on the B in SBIR. The previous speaker talked about all the fantastic scientists who start companies and don't know thing one about running a business and the financing and all of the other things involved in doing great science, which are equally important in a business and the, the science. This can help with any and all of those things. We participate in the Innovation Core or i -Core program. We have a NIH version of it for our phase one active awardees. We actually have a comp uh, open now, I think, for a cohort of phase one awardees to participate in i -Core. <coughs> We send companies and pay for companies registration, in some cases travel, to attend partnering forums and investor pitches all over the country. And you can see some of them there. We're working on a relationship with the Angel Capital Association, which is a huge organization of thousands and thousands of angels that I'm sure is, is, is should be on your, on, your menu, uh, on your mind. But once you kind of get in, then we have a lot more we can help you with. We'll help you, out, get, we'll help you get in as well. Um, but uh, you know, once you have an award, we have, we are really creating an ecosystem. So we're not just giving you the phase one and two award thing, have fun, good luck. We want to help you succeed in every way we can. So we have all these other programs, some of which we pay for with that expired admin funds. Uh, to help you build uh, a strong company. We want your success is our success. We don't want to fund you and watch you fail if we have means to help you out along the way. It's kind of okay to fail if the science goes that way, which is how science goes a lot of times, but not because we can't do everything we can um, business-wise. Lastly, stay connected. So I have an SBR listserv. It has 18, 20,000 people on it. How many folks get my, the emails? So we don't send them out all the time. We don't spam you, but when we send them out, they're important. You'll get one next week about the new Omnibus. It's long because it's a lot of explanation and about the webinars. NIH grants contract, that's the weekly notification we tweet. Um, the email address at the bottom, sbir at od.nih.gov is not a spam box. It goes to these five people who work in my office who are covering the box for me while I'm out. These are the people who help me in the office of the director run the SBR program and we have expertise for all of you. I'm a scientist, as you know. I have uh, program expertise. Rob is a former banker and a grants officer for 20 years. JP is a card-carrying patent attorney. 
Julie is our card-carrying statistician, and we have a fantastic communication specialist who does all of our outreach and webinars. And so with that, I'm happy to stop and take questions if we have some time. Thank you. Is it okay for the trials to be the first in human outside of the U.S.? And uh, if you're going to be getting the, the dire application of the pack, when do you think that will So, two questions. Do we fund first in human outside of the U.S. clinical trials? The answer is maybe. You need to talk to a program officer. So, as some of you know, foreign work is not allowed on SBRST tier. All the work has to happen in the U.S. except if there is a unique patient population or re specific resource that is only found abroad and cannot be found in the U.S., then yes, it could be allowed. Cheaper work abroad, like it's cheaper to do it, is not a sufficient foreign justification. But obviously there are many diseases in clinical trials that are very specific to patient populations outside of the U.S., and that could be okay. The second question is, if we get direct phase two back, when will we fire that up again? It's going to take us months, six months or plus to do it because we get the new authority. We have to see if they changed it. We have to rewrite and issue funding opportunities or adjust them and get them on the street in advance of a deadline. So it takes us time to do that. But it would be six months or so, give or take. Yes. Um, you, in the definition of clinical trials, has expanded. So there are a lot of things that probably are relatively smaller projects. But a full blown phase one or phase two is pretty expensive. It's going to be outside the budget. <laughs> that hasn't changed. Um, you know, big, full phase one and two clinical trials for a, a big disease you know, where you're going to need thousands of enrollments is not within the scope of an SBIR, typically. You might have smaller trials, or you might also bring in other money. You, you know, companies with these big things may have partnerships and provide some of the money from outside. So obviously, the work has to be scoped within the budget of SBIR. Um, but this is where you're going to look at partnerships. Um, the vast majority of small businesses aren't also going to be making pharmaceutical drugs when it gets to market. You're going to be scooped up, or the technology acquired, or the thing licensed by a medium to big pharma company or device manufacturer who's going to do the work downstream. But you've got to get to that point where you've de-risked and made it attractive for them to scoop in and, and work with you on it. Yes, ma'am. Can you talk more about fast tracks? Sure. Pros and cons of fast tracks versus other types of funding. So when you're, when you're coming into the program, you only have two choices. You're applying for a phase one or you're applying for a fast track. Um, a fast track, you really need to have a really strong company and, le and uh, business plan thought out. You're applying for three years worth of money, one or two million dollars, phase one, with quantitative milestones leading into phase two. You have to have the whole plan thought out for three years put into a 12-page research strategy. And so it's four companies that are going to have pretty good preliminary data. They're kind of going to have the phase one in the bag. Um, and, you know, you can't, you're going to get paid for work you've already done, but, you know, you have to kind of scope out some work and, and break off a piece for phase one. You, nobody's coming into the program for $150,000. I mean, it's great money, but you heard it costs $90,000 to make to earn $150,000. That's, that's a loss leader. You're in, the, you're in the program for the phase two and the 2B. And so, but you got to get there at the moment through phase one or fast track. And so it's really, most companies think they're ready for fast track, and mostly they're not. So um, it depends on where they are, how much preliminary data they have, how strong their team, and long-term planning and thinking is. And it's a good discussion to have with a program officer. And you think the chance of fast track to the <laughs> They're about the same. I mean, look, it's a 15% it's a success rate, but if you have to look at the volume. So, and then I'll go to another question, but there it is. Yeah. So if you look at total fast track SBAR applications, 512, 67 awards, we had 10 times the amount of phase one applications. The success rate's about the same, but the volume is different. If you look at STTR fast track, 109 applications, 16 awards, NIH wide. So it's around 10% volume of our program. So it's right for a certain type of company. It's nothing I can like write down and, and say what it, what it is, but so we're going to go there, then here. Okay. <laughs> 
Can I compare what NIH looks for in SBRs versus NSF? Um, it's really related to the peer, if you just look at the peer review criteria, we all kind of want the same thing. We want really good, solid science that's going to lead to a product that's going to meet our mission. Our mission is improving public health. NSF is broader science, and they do cover a little bit of life science. Um, so we're not that different in what we want. Um, NSF has their own set of re uh, review criteria. We have ours. They're not as far different as people might think. But um, we all have our own processes by handling that. Yes, sir. Hey guys, we'd like to ask you, will the U.S. government require royalty free for very good question. What is intellectual property? What are the government's rights and what do they do? So the intellectual property and all the data rights under SBR and STTR belong to the small business, to the firm. The government doesn't own the IP. What the government does as a condition of award is allow us the right to exercise a royalty-free license. The government does not exercise that right and hasn't. So you basically, all the IP rights belong to the, the firm. And you, of course, have to talk with your attorneys and making sure you're taking appropriate protections at the appropriate stage. But we don't take IP rights. There was a question over here. Then we'll come up uh, in the back, then up here. Yes. Well, uh, apart from a client too late, what are the most domestic uh, mistakes you can So aside from applying too late, what are the, some of the most common mistakes? Um, people really need to pass their application around before they send it in to some people. Um, people think they know how to write and think they have a great idea, and all that may be true, but writing a grant is a learned art and skill, and it's about telling a convincing story about your product. Um, it's not just a collection of experiments, and you have to really make the case of the significance of the scope of the problem. Um, unlike, you know, with the website, you really need to talk about this disease is a big problem, it has this many million patients, costs the healthcare industry this amount of money, existing uh, treatments don't do enough, and what I've got, what we're going to do is this, and it's not 5 or 10% better, it's not 20% better, it's 200% better, or it's going to bring the cost down, not by 5 or 10 or 20%, but by tenfold, and so you need to tell those stories and then and uh, build it in there. And there was one in the back. Yes, ma'am, and then you, sir. How much preliminary data do we expect? Phase one, we quote expect none because it says preliminary data not required for phase one. You are competing against 5,000 people, most of which have preliminary data in their phase one application. So you're going to want to. Now, will we fund an application on a fantastic, groundbreaking idea with uh, no preliminary data? Yes, but it's got to have a solid background and explanation that, that overcompensates for that. Yes, uh, yes um, this deck is, the deck is freely available. If you don't get it, you can email me, and I'll, I'll, I'll send it out. Not a problem. Right. So why do people choose STTR versus SBIR? The success rates are the same, you saw. Even though the program is different, 100 million versus 800 million, the success rates are about the same. You choose because one of two things. You got to have the university faculty member run the project. They can't leave their job and run the small business and be the PI. They got to stay at the university and they got to run the project or it's not going to work. And or the university has got to do a bigger chunk of work than the SBIR percentages allow. The university has got to do 40, 50, 60 percent of the work. Then you can do an STTR. Can the STTR be done by the Can the STTR be run by? The faculty and the company. Yes, you can have them co-lead the grant. So, how are we good? Last one? Uh, Quick question. What is the success rate of the technology driven grant? Not a clinical, but nothing to do with So, what is the success rate of a technology driven grant, non clinical? Like, a, like we, don't break out, we don't break out the numbers. We don't have that information to break it out that way. Um, it's not going to be that different, but we don't break it out by technology type, just overall. All right, well, thank you very much. I appreciate your time.